All right, we're live. Let's go, baby. I can hear you. Hopefully, everyone else can hear us too. Let us know in the comments where you guys are tuning in from. I'll make sure we're live on all the different streams. All right, we are set. Cool. See comments coming in. Let us know uh, if you're on Facebook. I think you have to sign in. Splash. Yeah, there should be a link at the top that you can click, give your name, and it'll allow us to see your name. Otherwise, it shows Facebook user like this where we don't know who you are leaving a comment for us. Which is kind of fun. We get to, to <laughs> try and, and guess make... who it is. Right. But uh, poor things can happen. I think I broke the cardinal rule of broadcasting. I have a sideways stripe, which may mess with some of your eyes. So I apologize if I give anybody a migraine. You have like... um the what is it called the cinematic black bars around your video too y'all uh might take the hat off just got done uh took my son up to michigan the senior pga last week was the, the junior pga slash the regular one uh very few people almost nobody attends these things especially on a thursday and friday so we pretty much had free reign of the course uh i got a, on a little radio interview which was fun got to say about 10 words on radio mom always said nice. i had a face made for radio um, and it's really fun bringing a four-year-old with you because everybody looks at him because they're wondering why a little kid's out on a golf course. So we, uh, we had a great time, caught, got back just in the nick of time. So we're looking forward to this. Is he still practicing his golf swing? You know what? He's, he switched to every other sport pretty much. He, he loves golf still, but he's, he's been, uh, you know, doing a little tennis and pickleball and, you know, baseball. I'm not going to push it on him, but you know, be awesome to get out there. Got to meet some really cool people. There you get you you got tour players' wives walking around with their pets and dogs and kind of hanging out and uh, actually got to meet the caddy for Francesco Molinari and he got to hang out with Elliot a little bit today um, and he loves nice. golf loves you know young kids but that sounds bad he loves kids um, <laughs> just, uh, just he a, loves a, young kids specifically <laughs> let's not let's not let's let's strike that for the record but really nice fella. Uh, he's from Spain. Uh, Molinari's from Italy, but uh, this guy's from Spain. He was following Ola Thabel around. So had a fun time. Really neat to see some guys you watch, you know, growing up on on, on TV. And you get to kind of see them in real life or meet the people around them. And uh, I love people mm. in the world. So nice people from all over. Matthew, uh, I guess we'll kick this back off. We've been doing yeah. this is five so we've survived this is still going thanks for again for making these happen still going. And, and uh yeah what are you excited about for this one i'm excited to learn a little more about old books because i know nothing about older books and collectibles but like everyone you see them all over the place and wonder if you've passed over some gems in the past and so i'm curious if there's some little tidbits we can pull out of how to spot things a little better when you're out in the wild or just looking through things because i know like you and me when we we're going through that warehouse in springfield we knew we were passing by things left and right we had no idea about so it'll be fun to learn some tips and tricks on, on how to handle those yeah so we'll we'll introduce our guest in just a second um last time we talked about the an amazon book with a sales rank of zero that sold four times during a lunch break that was kind of a fun story I don't have anything really fascinating. I've got a good sale actually of an old old set of books that we'll get to with Max here in just a second. Any interesting things on your side? Interesting things. I know just nothing the majorly interesting. The biggest interesting thing was this morning when we got an email saying that our new price uh, credentials were going to be shut down next month. Everyone that's a member of New Price probably got an email this morning saying that. Something about new prices, credentials, June 24th will be shut down. So we're talking with Amazon. Uh, we did not receive an email from them before they emailed everyone else. So we'll figure out what that issue is. Right now, everything's active with new price. Everything's up. You can still reprice. So we'll get that resolved before whatever cutoff date was listed on that email. But that was a nice, fun surprise this morning. And typical Amazon fashion, they didn't you know, email us and say, hey, here's your question. And, and just to be clear, that's totally separate than Scout IQ. It's different credentials. Yes. Um, so if you're, you know, on the IQ train, nothing to worry about there. Um, and, and we'll, we'll sort it out anyway. we got a month, but in typical Amazon fashion, they didn't go right to the source. They went to all of the users and our hunch is it's related to the SP API, which is the new API that Amazon's rolling out, uh, over the next couple of months, but yeah. by the end of the year it has to be completely migrated over. So hopefully you didn't, didn't get scared away by that. Yeah, we well, should be all good there. Susan says she has some old books. 
wants to learn how to sell them. So we, we will do that. Well, let's introduce our guests. And not enough, you guys didn't come here to hear us yak about stuff. Um, so let's uh, let's bring on our, our guest. All right. We, we were teasing Max as we as we got on here. There we right. There he is. Hey. I made it, Caleb. I made it. <laughs> I, I was I was running behind and, and uh, we were doing a little mic check and poor Max was trying to click his link and it was opening in Firefox and the software we're using, StreamYard, is phenomenal, but it doesn't work in Firefox. And so we're like, no, no Chrome. Click the link. No, right, click the link. And uh, you know, Max is really good with the old school technology and I was giving him a little bit of grief, but we're <laughs> glad you're here. Thank yeah. you, Caleb. Thank you, Matthew. So Max, tell us, uh, tell us who you are. Tell us where you're, where you're from, and uh, we'll kind of get into your, your background, your history, and, and how we met as well. All right. Originally from Massachusetts, but uh, my parents moved down here in early 70s. Um, so I grew up down here in South Florida. I live in Deerfield Beach, Florida now, which is uh, part of Fort Lauderdale. And um, I'm a full-time eBay bookseller. Um, I specialize mostly in antiquarian or, you know, older and collectible books, books most likely without barcodes. And um, I built a very successful business doing that um, while I was teaching for 18 years in the public school system. And two years ago, I got out of the school system to devote uh, all of my time to this business helped the business grow and uh, met Caleb along the way. And we developed a friend, business friendship and did some stuff together. And uh, we knew we were going to do a, some sort of conversation podcast sooner or later. And, and now is the time, I guess, because um, we've been talking about it, Caleb and I, for a couple of years, actually. Yeah, uh, you've been uh, you've been dropping subtle and not so subtle things for a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's been fun to see your business grow from from when we first met. So South Florida is not the most friendly atmosphere for for books, just in terms of the humidity and everything else. Does that tend to be a, a problem for you? I think it's a problem everywhere, uh, whether it's New England and mustiness and coldness or uh, South Florida and the heat and humidity. But uh, as long as the books are in air condition and away from sunlight, you're not going to do any major damage to them. A lot of books, though, you know, they are damaged when when I get them and um as long as the subject matter is okay, it's still going to sell. Uh, I think in the past couple months, I've sold at least 10, 20 books minus their covers, minus their spines. And uh, it's the subject matter that the people are after, the historical value as well. Yeah. So uh, I guess I don't know how we originally met. I knew we've been talking on Instagram and probably Facebook for a bit. But Matthew and I, a couple of years ago, Matthew could probably dig up the link while we're while we're getting into it. But yeah. we uh, we were in Springfield. One of our business partners lives near that area of Missouri, and it just so happened that there was somebody reached out. I forget. Maybe they found us. Maybe we found them. And they had a family member pass away. I think their father passed away, and they had a entire kind of a warehouse. His dad was a big collector of books and uh, had a giant warehouse full of books that we went in. So we actually recorded some content in there. It was a lot of just liquor boxes full of books. And it's just stacked like, you know, any collector. I guess he had done, I, I don't know if he'd ever really gotten around to doing stuff at flea markets and trying to resell them. I think he was just collecting, collecting, collecting and never really tried to, to flush stuff out. He had a ton of first editions, a lot of older books. And, and again, as we're primarily Amazon sellers, we know there's value there, but we really don't know what to look for. Um, you know, some of the, the basics we do, but. Um, Matthew and I kind of went through with everything with barcodes and then, so we, I think Max, we had just caught wind of you or just heard about you. And, uh, we were, we were trying to coax you to flying out there and you kept coming up with excuses and you're like, Hey, I don't, I don't trust you. I think you might try and murder me. <laughs> and, uh, we ended up just doing something digitally. You're like, Hey, it's fine. Just, just FaceTime me in. We'll, you know, jump on a Skype call. And I was like, well, we don't have much time. And like, that's just inefficient, whatever. I kind of was trying to push you away. And we jumped on and it was like a computer was in my head. He's literally a walking encyclopedia. So Matthew and I would walk around, literally pop open a box of older books. And I just had my phone up and was just kind of, you know, panning over them. And instantly Max like, oh, go to that one. Look at this one. Uh, no, no, go to the third one. Over. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's, that's probably worth 40 bucks. Okay, next one over. Ooh, that might be a hundred dollar book. Oh my gosh, that that's set over there. You have to look at it. Look at the flyleaf. What's the what's the publication here? 
So he just knew his stuff. And I was like, oh, my gosh, it's like one of those episodes of Stump the Star. <laughs> and Max literally knew almost every book that we kind of showed him. So hmm. phenomenal. All we did, we'll, we'll kind of get into the program and, and kind of what Max offers now. But yeah. I don't like to do eBay. I do a very little bit of it, but we're primarily Amazon. We're primarily stuff with barcodes. So Max is literally the perfect opposite. If you, if you drew a Venn diagram, there's very little overlap in the middle. Mm -hmm. we can, there it is. You know, we're over here on the Amazon world. Max is over here on the eBay world. And, uh, you know, he's, he's doing the collectible stuff that I don't even want to know how many books I've passed up and recycled or donated that, you know, there's definitely value there. So we boxed that all up, sent it to Max. He's been selling stuff you know, from that lot and from a couple other deals that we've done. Um, and actually we had a sale this past week, I think. Yeah. A couple of days ago. You want to, you want to spill the beans on that one? Uh, it was uh, a 48 volume set of Victor Hugo's works in French. Also ex library. Um, I think that came from Chicago. If I remember correctly, Caleb, um, it that had been Southern Illinois, I'm, I'm like, I'm blanking. They kind of all run together, but I think it was Southern yeah. Illinois. And it was a 48 volume set. We, we probably had it uh, listed for about a year and a half, but it sold the other day for just under $600. Yeah. And so I, was really good. I, I was excited to send you that text message. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun one to get. It's always fun when you, uh, when you work for like with somebody else and you can send them a note that says, Hey, something really cool just happened and I'm sending you money. Versus, hey, we need to charge you something, right? Yeah. It's always a fun text to say, hey. I, I, you're gonna I do it daily. I, I love waking up in the morning and seeing what sold while, while I was sleeping. And hopefully a lot of that is consigner, consigner books. And I can start their day off with those big sales as well. Yeah. Well, let's take a, let's take a quick pause here to recognize our sponsors that we don't have. Um, I want to dive back when we come back here. I want to get back into your, your history and your background and how you became so knowledgeable in books. But I forgot to jump in. This is Books and Bourbon. This is episode number five. So whether you're watching, I know a lot of people on the West Coast, it's one o'clock. Maybe you shouldn't be drinking just yet. Um, what are? Let's go around the horn. What are we drinking today? You, yeah, I'll, I'll go first. So I'm the only one drinking, I think, today. <laughs> today and I'm the one in the earliest time zone. So <laughs> and I'm on East Coast time today. That's what I'm telling myself. I've just got some Basil Hayden toast. I don't know if that's focusing. It's probably focusing on me. I have to cover up my face there. Um, Basil Hayden is just a good, simple, cheaper bourbon. That's good, but I hadn't tried toast before. I found this in the store a little while ago and decided to give it a try, and it's been pretty good. I don't know much history on Basil Hayden, but if you like toasty bourbons, Basil Hayden toast really has that charred oak barrel double flavor to it, so it's good. Fantastic. And if you like toast, you should look up anything that is um, uh, double oaked is another phrase that basically means the same thing. It's, I believe it's the same process. So Woodford Reserve has a double oak. You can usually find it for 60 bucks. Costco will sell it for 45 sometimes. And it is a, it's a pretty good bottle. So enjoy that. Max, what are you drinking? I'm drinking a 2022 Perrier with lime. <laughs> slim, slim, slim aluminum can. That's a, that's a tough vintage to track down. It goes easy this time of the afternoon too, though. <laughs> That's beautiful. I, uh, I I went a little too hard last night. Karaoke in town. It's a small town. We don't have much else to do. So um, my, I'm giving my liver a little bit of a break today. But we were drinking last night. I work. Or I don't work. I feel like I work there. There's a small. And I've got the fuzz turned way up. Maybe I should. Holy cow. <laughs> it doesn't wow. want to focus on it. Mine was doing the same thing. <laughs> Lola is getting out of control. Am I grainy at all either? Like around the edges? Maybe I need to change that. Maybe a little around the edges. But it could just be the connection. I couldn't tell. They also think I'm offline, so that's fun. Anyway, we'll we'll try and touch that up. Anyway, this is a gotta, uh, keep going. It's a uh, it's a rye whiskey. It says limestone branch. It's out of uh, it is Kentucky. Typically, when you get in the limestone region, that's how you kind of filter the bourbon out, and it makes it really really smooth. That's a really popular process in Tennessee, so just south of Kentucky, obviously. But this is really good. I found it uh, when down in Kentucky a couple weeks back. And typically rye is, is pretty spicy and hot and, and kind of burns the tongue because it goes through the limestone. This is actually remarkably smooth. So this was really good. It's hundred percent rye and well, the proof is 94. So it's less than 
alcohol anyway, which is also why it is smoother. So that was kind of fun. Got to enjoy that with some friends last night at the local restaurants here. And uh, I am drinking water. So Max, represent you and I can uh, just <laughs> drink water. So if you guys see me drinking a lot, it's it's not bourbon. It's it's water. Sure, sure. Oh, we got we got a comment for you, Caleb. Oh boy, three new bottles. Help me decide which to open. Evan Williams single barrel, Jack Daniels bottle and bond, or Elijah Craig private barrel, barrel proof. Well, barrel proof. Everybody loves the high proof, so maybe that's uh, maybe that's a good one to start. I do like Elijah Craig in general. Um, that stuff's pretty spicy. It's really good for sipping around a campfire. I don't know that I've had. Actually, I have an Evan Williams single barrel. I haven't opened it, so maybe maybe I'll join you next week and open that one. My vote is going to be the Elijah Craig barrel proof um but uh probably next up will be the evan williams and lastly would be the jack daniels nice all right max now that we've thanked our sponsors uh <laughs> let's jump back in so where did you go to book school how did you become so knowledgeable in the world of, yeah. of old books? that's a great great question i was an english major in college so i was a voracious reader and when i uh got back uh, down to Florida, I got a job in an antiquarian bookstore. It was one of those uh, three-story, very dark and dank uh, bookstores, over 100,000 books. This was pre-internet. This was pre-eBay, pre-Amazon. If you wanted to sell a book with someone not coming into your store, you had to put it in a catalog, and that catalog would go to all the book, seller, book buyers across the country. So you would have to actually handle the book. You'd have to understand about the publisher and and what a real first edition is. There's a lot of uh, misinformation um, on what first editions are that's that's out there. And um, back then when I was learning the business without realizing what I was learning, I was handling all these uh, antiquarian and rare books and understanding the value. And most importantly, understanding the customer who bought these types of books, who, you know, who bought uh, a Civil War book specifically about a specific regiment, um, not just the history of the Civil War. So I learned really about niche markets and uh, those niche markets is really what what the people like to buy in the in the rare book world. Um, and so I worked there for probably close to a decade and um, moved on to some other things and teaching and coaching girls basketball in high school. But I was always going to thrift stores always pulling out good books and building up a great book collection for myself without ever thinking I was going to sell anything. I was just collecting cool stuff. Um, somewhere down the line, I got an idea that uh, to start selling these and uh, tried to figure out how to sell something on eBay. I didn't know there was no content out there at the time. And I learned, you know, after a couple of days of how to list a book, I finally listed uh, three books one day and all three books sold within 24 hours. And, you know, the first time you hear that ka it was a life changer. Uh, I get you. I don't know. Yeah. The, the, the shock of pulling a book off of your shelf, taking pictures of it, and then you get, and then someone buys it in, you know, in Germany or Oregon or Massachusetts, and they're thousands of miles away from you. It instantly, almost like an epiphany, opened up a different world for me. Um, and so I would start listing my books and I was making, you know, making a, a nice side hustle as I was teaching high school. And my goal at the time was if I could ever make $100 a day selling books on eBay, that's all I would need along with my teaching. Um, but it blew up and it blew up pretty quick. Um, and I, I had to start replenishing my stock. So I was finding myself after school or after basketball practice going to thrift stores to the, to the wee minute they closed, uh, just trying to find good books, listing them in my spare time and squeezing hours and minutes in and, uh, and doing the shipping. Um, the hundred dollars a day, of course, turned into 200, which turned into $300 a day. And, and I was sort of coming to a crossroads in my life. What happens if I do $500 a day? I'm making well under $200 a day as a teacher. Now I can stay home and sell books for $500 a day. Um, I got out of teaching two years ago, went full time into this, and now it has just exploded. And, um, 
a few years ago as the internet community and the social media community was coming out with with selling things on eBay and Amazon, I was noticing this whole new world about Gaylords. And uh, I, I remember specifically watching a Reezy video going through a Gaylord and just scanning all the barcodes and just, and they kept saying, recycle the non barcode books, recycle the non barcode books. And instantly I was like, what do you mean recycle them? You can't recycle them. That's where the real money is. Um, and so that idea started marinating in my head. Uh, and probably within a year of that idea is when I probably first reached out to you, Caleb, and started, you know, we were sort of birthing this idea about trying to get to these gay lords. And um, I started doing it on my own and reaching out to some FBA sellers and uh, convincing them what I can do for them and please give me a shot. And uh, now we have over 20, you know, closer to 30 consigners you know, all over this beautiful country uh, that are sending me books. I, you know, sometimes they come in boxes. Sometimes they'll send me one box or eight boxes at a time. Sometimes they'll send me a pallet of books. Sometimes they'll send me, like you did, Caleb, they'll send me a Gaylord. Um, I remember that, uh, I think it was in that library in Chicago, you just had a push card and I would tell you which books to put in the card. So it went right from your finger into the, into the card and into a Gaylord and right to my, right to my garage. Um, so it was very, yeah, it was very instantaneous for me. And I believe if I remember correctly, we probably sold a few books rather quickly. And, um, so I was always excited to send you those text messages. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of fun in, in the early stages there. That was, uh, that was an interesting one. I should try and dig up some photos. We, um, had a giant box truck. They didn't have a lift gate. We couldn't rent one with a lift gate. Uh, they just didn't have it available or whatnot. So imagine just a giant U-Haul truck. You know, I think it was a 20, it was a big guy, 26 foot maybe. Yeah, like was, that's the biggest, it's 26, I think, for U-Hauls. So it's only supposed to hold 10,000 pounds. Smile, don't tell the insurance companies, all that good stuff. <laughs> People have, have weighed them down. But this was a, a location, actually it did have a lift gate, but they didn't have the ability to get the, the book. The library had a, a series of steps to get upstairs, like to get to the main level. And everything was on the main level. There was some stuff in the basement that we had to get up. There was no ground level access. That was the only way out other than a regular door. And you can't fit Gaylers through a door. So we either had to decide to load up everything that we wanted. And part of our, our deal with the library was we had to remove everything. So we had to get every book off the shelves and put it into Gaylers, whether we wanted it or not. And so that was a really tough day because we had to decide if we were going to set the Gaylords up outside and literally move everything from inside outside and then put on the lift gate and go from there. And then we just got the bright idea. I wonder if we can just like take the lift gate down, raise it all the way up and then just back up to the stairs. And it actually, it just barely spanned. Like the back tires were touching the bottom of the steps, <laughs> the edge of the lift gate probably held, you know, maybe six, eight inches of overlap. And we were able to drop that down onto the concrete and take the center, you know, pole out between the doors and actually fill the Gaylords, put them on a pallet jack and get them into the truck. So that was one of those like, oh, my goodness, this is just the geometry of the steps, the geometry of the truck. It worked out. So I'm, I'm glad that worked out. Otherwise, you might not have gotten them. <laughs> so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about eBay. We'll, we'll come back to the, the program and how you can benefit other people. So, again, we we typically in that. I don't know, Matthew, did you ever really try and sell much on eBay in terms of older books or did you just? I've of... never sold older books on eBay. I've sold other items on eBay, but not older books, no. Yeah, so for those of you that do Gaylers, you, of course, run into this a lot. You get a lot of books without barcodes. You run into old sets, old into, you know, just old musty, we call them dusties. Um, just like an old bottle of bourbon is a dusty. You get these old dusty books and we'd run across them and typically you're like yeah maybe it's worth looking at or sometimes it catches your eye and you're like i bet i could sell it on ebay and you can kind of look up stuff on sold history on ebay but most most books pre like 1973 don't even have isbn's so in terms of researching it you've got to look up the edition you got to know which year it was published you got to kind of find the right book and it's not as easy to match it up one for one as it is when you just scan a barcode and, and figure it out on amazon so I've let a lot of this stuff go in the past and I know there's money there and I know you can research and understand. And, and Steve Eisenstein 
is another really helpful resource. He has a radio show program called Bucks on the Bookshelf. And I think he's down in South Florida as well, Max. I don't know if you've run across him, but he's got like a, I think it's a Saturday morning show that he does regularly. And it's a little segment, talks about collectible books. And, you know, he, he deals with really collectible stuff, you know, stuff in the you know thousands and tens to even hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but I remember, you know, we, we look at the stuff in the Gaylords and you're like, man, you're throwing money away and cherry picking. I'm sure I've overlooked a lot of stuff too. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about like the eBay model. Do you sell on other platforms as well? Or is it primarily just eBay? It's 100% eBay. Um, we take, eight to 12 pictures of each book. We show the edges, we show the copyright page. I mean, we're, we're trying to sell to the, to the discerning book buyer who wants these higher end books. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's completely different from listing a book on Amazon uh, merchant fulfilled where, you know, you scan the barcode, put it on your shelf and, and away you go. Um, to do, to do a good eBay book, you know, it's, it's going to take a minute to 90 seconds to get it done the right way consistently. And so you can do 20 to 30 books in an hour or, or 50 books in a couple hours shift, which is what we try to aim for here. Um, but it's definitely a lot different. And there's a lot of uh, Amazon sellers out there who are scanning books and they just don't have time to, to go on the computer and do the research and, and match up the information with the proper information or the right information to make sure it's the right edition that people are looking for. And um, so, you know, it's a completely different world than that. Sure. So everything pretty much on eBay, you take good photos, you obviously know what they're worth. How do you, how do you come up with the right price? Do you do auctions? Do you do fixed prices? Uh, obviously you have a, a really good understanding of what, what a book is worth, but uh, how do you come up with that initial price? And then, you know, how often do people, you know, lowball you or how, how does that process work? We get lowballed every day <laughs> from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed. Uh, I price things higher than the general market because everything I do is a fixed price. 99% of the time with a fixed price with the best offer. Um, but sometimes you sell those books rather quickly. They don't even make a bet. They don't even make an offer. Um, they just want the book. Um, and that, you know, 80% of the time, most book people are just buying the book because they want it. Um, they're not trying to nickel and dime at all. Um, we also charge shipping. So there's a um, little, little money to be made off shipping. Um, but I use a host of resources. Uh, you know, eBay is okay to price books, but, um, it's not the best source. Uh, it doesn't go back far enough. And especially with the kind of books I'm dealing with, you know, I mean, we're dealing with sometimes books that are hundred, 200 years old. Um, that those types of books aren't selling on eBay every day in the first 90 day period before they wipe out that slate. Uh, worthpoint.com is a very good site. Uh, a books or abe.com is a very good site. Uh, but there's a whole host of sites out there to do the research. But the most important thing is you have to know what you're looking for. You know, the title alone and the author isn't always enough. You know, some people are looking for a specific edition because those editions change throughout the years as well. And the information is different. Yep. Well, my uh, I, my little brother worked for Google and he kind of jokes. He's like, one of the reasons I'm a good programmer slash developer is I, I can use Google better than others. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you know, because I kind of asked him too, like when you study programming languages, do you just know the syntax? Do you know how everything works? And the answer typically is, well, kind of like they've solved problems before. But they just understand how logic and the, the general code works. And then you have to go and Google other ways to kind of go about it. So, right. you know, he's like, I'm really good at Google. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I know what to ask Google to get the desired answer. So it sounds like what you're doing, you know, kind of which directions to sort of to, to kind of pursue to track down what that actual value may be worth. Right. And, and at the same time, I also have a gr very good idea of what, the book buying public wants. So for instance, when you, you and I were on that video in Chicago, you know, you were asking me, well, what, where, what section should I start in first? And I remember that conversation. I said, go to genealogy. Um, yep. So there are certain types of categories, you know, that people really are, are sought after. Um, and genealogy is one of the, one of those categories, yeah. you know, anything genealogy. Sure. So 
And, and then let's talk through like sell through type stuff in the Amazon space. You know, we're typically sending in stuff, you know, e-scores of, you know, a couple, typically not super low e-scores. Of course, every once in a while, books with ranks of zero can uh, can can still sell. But as we as we discovered last week, see uh, flips for miles says uh, we got only a couple likes. Everybody, everybody like the video. Make miles feel better about it. Um, <laughs> Love Miles. He's uh, he's such a such an encourager. So thanks for thanks for being on here as well, Miles, and jumping in um, and and pumping up the crowd. But I forget where I was. Miles made me lose my train of thought. I was talking about genealogy books and certain categories. Oh yeah, and then I was, let's get. I want to have a quick understanding of sell through rate. So on Amazon, we typically list stuff. You know, the kind of the old school rules: don't list it with a sales rank under a million, which is a little bit BS. And hopefully, people that have followed us for a while know that. But in general, on Amazon, you typically send it to sell anywhere between you know twenty-ish percent of your inventory each month. So if you have a thousand books in inventory, you should be selling you know one percent a day, merchant fulfilled, maybe a little less a day FBA. And typically, you, you tend to sell about twenty percent for the month. So about 200 books on an inventory of 1,000. What's a typical turn rate that you're seeing in your business? Because I imagine it's it's a lot more long tail books, isn't it? Yes and no. Um, it all depends on it all depends on what I'm getting. Um, I recently acquired um, from one of my consigners about 200 uh, Nintendo Power magazines from the 80s and 90s. I think we probably sold 100 to 150 in the first seven days. Wow. So the sell through for that was very quick. Um, but, you know, the, the set that we just sold for you uh, last week, we had that for probably 18 months uh, before that sold. But um, I'm selling between 30 and 50 books a day um, all over the country, all over the world, in fact. Um, and, and so how many, how many active listings do you have right now, roughly? Over 12,000. Okay. So if we do the math. If we if we go on the con, on the high end of that fifty a day, you said twelve thousand listings. Yeah, but that that isn't all books either, though. I would say probably six to eight thousand are books. Yeah. On uh, if if it's even ten thousand, right. we're looking at a selfie rate of half a percent a day, which actually isn't isn't terrible. Although if it is on the lower end of thirty books a day, then you're looking at a third of one percent. Right. So multiply that by thirty days in a month, you're looking at you know. Uh, Still nine to ten percent sell through, so that, that's actually not very bad. And do you have a rough feel? Like you know, I sent you a couple of Gaylords from I think Chicago. Of those books that I sent you that you listed, do you have a rough idea of how many? Like what your total sell through will be? Like I in think, the Amazon, book, we typically sell seventy to eighty percent of every book that we list. Right. Yeah, I was about to say. I think that we probably sold seventy percent of that uh, Gaylor already. Um, and then there's some higher price books that we have um, that haven't sold yet, but you know they're going to sell eventually. So I don't know if we'll ever get to 100%. Um, some things just sputter and die on the shelves, um, but I think we'll probably get to 80 to 90% with what you with what you sent me. Yeah, and part of that is your knowledge because you're listing stuff that's probably going to sell. You understand where there's a market yeah. for something versus you know whatever and again i think the same rules apply whether you're doing ebay or amazon it's how risky is it if it's not likely to sell then you need to have a high profit potential to even justify doing it versus if it's really likely to sell like those nintendo guides you can you can accept a really small margin of a buck or two or three per book just because the the chances of it selling are incredibly high yeah except for the fact that in the ebay collectible market we're really we're not dealing so much with smaller margins. We're you know those magazines were selling from fifteen dollars a piece to one hundred and fifty dollars a piece. So the the uh, consigner who gave me those magazines, you know, they had a very good month with me. Um, you know, and and those were just those were magazines that they were going to be thrown out. You know, they were in a gay lord and they didn't know what to do with them. Uh, and I had been talking to them for a while, and uh, they sent them my way, and. Um, I'm sure they're happy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So what's a what's a typical like what's an average selling price of most of the stuff that you sell? Right. Uh I would say the average sale price is between twenty and thirty dollars. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of what the day of the FBA used to be. But I, I mean I've sold um I sold about twenty something books today and 
the lowest price one was eight dollars, but the highest price one was two fifty. So yeah. the, the range is always wide, and the, and the range is like that every day. Um, just because you're dealing with the antiquarian market, you're going to be selling high end books usually every day. Yep, that's uh, fantastic. Tell us a little bit about your your uh, like how do you store these? How do you locate them properly? Like, do you have a, a whole series of shelves and use like the number and letter system for the bays? Or do you just have a room full of boxes that you try not to knock over every time you walk? walk well, in? you can see behind me already <laughs> where some of them are. But um, I have a two car garage that I converted to a bookstore. Um, and um, that's what we use. I have library shelving in there and everything is uh, lettered and numbered. You know, A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, you know, um, and we use those library shelves on both sides. And uh, we've, you know, we've stacked about 13,000 books in there and we have room for 20,000 more. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, what other like eBay challenges? Do you have a high return rate? Do you get disgruntled customers? I imagine if someone's spending a lot of money on a book, they tend to be a little more understanding, actually. Um, versus someone that's paying six bucks and gets angry that it was one day late. Right. Well, based on the horror stories I've heard from Amazon, yeah, there's nowhere, the return rate is nowhere near uh, that on eBay. I probably get a return once every 150 items. Um, and most of the time that's because the uh, USPS worker neglected the package going into the mailbox. They just stuffed it in and ripped off a corner of a book or something like that. But the, there's very few returns. Um, condition wise, this is why we take a lot of pictures. Uh, when you when you list an Amazon book, there's there's no multiple pictures to look at most of the time. When you do an eBay book, you're you know, we're taking up to 12 pictures. And so depending on that prospective buyer, if they have specific questions, they can always ask me. Um, but because we we take up to 12 pictures all questions are answered. If something has a uh, highlighting or handwriting in there, we make sure to take, we don't hide it. We make sure to take pictures of at least two of those pages. So people know that there's probably handwriting in there. I, I don't detail that in the description. I use the same description in every one of my books. Um, and I, I allow the pictures to tell the story of the book. Yep. Well, and again, because you have a higher selling price, you can afford to spend a little more time and, and put a little more love and attention into it. Right. One of the downsides, I have a marketing background. I used to do marketing for a joint replacement company. And I love being able to tell a story and you know show a little personality versus just selling widgets. And Amazon has really tried to turn books into widgets, to, to lack of a better term, because it's, it's just a commodity. You want a copy of Good to Great? Cool. Do you want merchant fulfilled or FBA? Do you, you know, which seller do you want? And ultimately price is the most important decision. And some people will look and they won't buy acceptable. And, you know, they're looking for a new copy or like new, right? So sometimes you're looking for better condition, but ultimately it's mostly about price. And, you know, very few sellers take photos of books. You certainly can and try and make your listing stand out on Amazon. But in the grand scheme of things, it's usually not worth the headache to actually go through that, that effort to do it just based on, on that eBay is a whole different world. You have the ability to take amazing photos, to let the book, you know, have a bit of personality and people can actually see what they're getting, which, which is, you know, it's a different game. It's a much slower game than some of us are used to in terms of, you know, scam list or seller list and just mowing through a pile of books and listing right. them as quickly as possible. You're, you're actually be able to kind of give them white glove treatment and, mm -hmm. and, you know, do the book justice that way. Yeah. We're holding every book. We're flipping through every book. Um, you know, we find some amazing things in books sometimes, too, because we do that. Um, but, yeah, each book is handled and, and gone through. And um, condition, you know, I don't want to say condition isn't an issue. Um, you know, there are some buyers out there who, who want the top condition book, but it all depends on the subject matter. If someone's buying a book from 1827, chances are they're not going to get, a, uh, you know, a high graded book. But if they're if someone's buying, I recently sold the Madonna sex book that came out in the 90s. That buyer asked me about condition because that book is inside of a, a silver mylar uh, cover and they wanted to know if there was any scratches or dents to it. So, you know, a lot of times it also depends on the book. There, there's a whole school of people who buy uh, landmark books for their kids and their homeschooling. 
And for some reason, they love those landmark books with the dust jackets. Uh, and they want to know the condition of the dust jacket. And they yep. want you to take pictures of not only the cover of the dust jacket, take the dust jacket off the book and show the inside. Uh, so, you know, there's all these little intricacies to these books. And um, the longer I do it, the more custom and more, uh, more knowledgeable I get with them. I'm still learning every day, too. Yep. That never uh, stops. In terms of shipping everything out, so there, there's no like FBA program with eBay. So you have to store everything, ship it out yourself, manually touch it. Are you like, what? what is a, an inexpensive, if someone buys an $8 book, how do you package that up and, and mail it? Because that's a question that gets asked a lot with Merchant Fulfilled. And then if you have a, you know, a $500 book, are you doing anything differently for that? Yeah, I'm a book lover. So whether it's a Nintendo Power Magazine for $15 or an $8 book, Everything is getting bubble wrapped. Um, if it's a magazine, it's also getting cardboard to keep it from not bending. But if it's if it's a book anywhere uh, north of two hundred dollars, it's being shipped in a box uh, with bubble wrap and not and not in a bubble mailer. It goes in a special book box. Uh, they're cheap enough to buy. And if you sell a two hundred dollar book, what's another dollar for a box uh, mm -hmm. to make sure it gets there the right way? Um, I have very few problems with that. Um, you know, I, I learned I learned by my boss back in the day. You know that you know these are commodities and and these are luxuries too. You know, people don't have to have books, and if they're spending their money on if they're spending a couple hundred dollars on a book, make sure you care for it the right way. And so that has stuck with me all these years, and and that's why you know I'll bubble wrap an eight dollar book. I just I want when that book arrives to that buyer. I want them to feel special when they open it and they go, this person cared about this book coming to me. Yeah. I, I love talking to you. You can just see the quality that, that you take care of the books, you take care of your business and you treat your customers with the same element. So that's very refreshing. Again, we tend to be in a commoditized world of widgets and it can be cutthroat and, you know, how many books can we scan through in a day? Right. And you're kind of going the opposite approach saying, let's, let's slow down. Let's find the value. Let's, you know, let's build the right relationships and see what this turns into. So that's, uh, it's, it's really refreshing to hear that. Um, Matthew, what other like eBay specific questions? Do you have anything there? And then we'll actually get to your <laughs> question. But if you guys do have questions and want to want Max to answer those, we'll kind of explain his program in just a second. And uh, if you have some other questions, I see a couple that have popped in here. Yeah. We'll field a bunch of those kind of round table style uh, near the end of this call. So go ahead and drop those as well. Yeah, so I have a few basic questions for you. One of them is because I see them all the time in the group, but also as questions I've had myself. So very beginner questions here, but you always see really popular fiction books like Harry Potter and stuff like that. Are first editions always valuable or does it not matter at all if you see first edition on something like Harry Potter or a popular book that was made a while ago? Anything that's a first edition, there's going to be a buyer for that. Um, but a... A business like the Harry Potter industry, whenever they release a new movie, there's always a new group of kids and new groups of parents who want to buy those first editions for those kids because they think they're going to be worth thousands and thousands of dollars 20 years from now. So always collecting the Harry Potter first editions is, is always good. But the problem with that is almost every Harry Potter book says first edition. <laughs> and you have to look at the number line because most buyers, most buyers, sadly, as long as the book says first edition, they think they're getting a first edition. But it, in order for it to be a first edition, there needs to be more information other than the words first edition. They produce so many of those books that they just didn't, they never took it out. And so, you could have a Harry Potter, the first book, and it could start at number 25, 26, 27, 28. Well, if it starts at 25, you're buying the 24th printing of the first edition. You're not buying the true That's first edition, which would be a number one barcode, uh, bar line one through 10. So, you know, I sometimes get upset when I see the, these things sold um, on eBay and, and it's not the right information. And and I know that there are going to be people years from now who are going to try to sell their first edition Harry Potter books to a bookseller and be like, I bought these. The person said they were first editions. And then they're going to get the rude awakening. So um, 
you know. No, that, that makes sense. Yeah, but but to answer your question, if there's a movie tie, if there's a book tie, a TV tie, I mean, if there's a news story or a historical tie, people are going to want those first editions, whether it's a paperback first edition by Avon or, or uh, you know, a Rand McNally Atlas first edition. There's yeah. always going to be that market for the first editions. All right. So another one for you then. That was a, that was a good answer to that. Uh, you always see old giant Bibles in thrift stores, things like that. Are old giant Bibles, there's so many of them, they're not worth very much? Or how do you know what Bibles are worth a lot? Because I know some of them are, but you see older giant Bibles all over the place. Any giant Bible, don't laugh at this, Caleb, any giant Bible, I'll take. <laughs> <laughs> the bigger, the better. If it has a latch and a buckle, even, be even better. The older, the better. Um. I just had a, I just sold the other day. I had a German Bible. Um, I, I sold it for one of our people in the chat. I see. Um, <laughs> I had a German Bible and um, the market's very hot for Bibles, but um, I didn't want to price it. Uh, I didn't want to put a number on it. So I want, I wanted to do auction just as an experiment because this consigner sends me books all the time and I wanted to try something different with them. So I listed the book for $9.99 auction and someone offered me $2.50 within the first two hours of that book being listed. They had to have it and we sold it. So, oh. um, you know, but but I also sell Bibles from 2001. Um, the only thing I can't sell as far as Bible goes is most of the time, if someone has already written their name on their ownership name on it um, and they've made notes, most of the time that's not a good Bible to sell unless it's a Freemasonry Bible and that Mason had signed his name and usually they put things inside the pages as well. You get some goodies in there too. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. But the Freemason Bibles are good too. But any, you know, when you, Matthew, when you say large, big Bibles, I would, if you saw those at a thrift store, I'll kill you if you don't send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds good. All right. Last one, then we'll get to the people in the chat because there are a lot of questions popping up. Are there any dates that we should keep our eye out for that if something was made before that or has a date before 19, whatever, 18, whatever, that it automatically has some value to it just because of its age? No, no, no. Just because, just because a book is old does not make it valuable. The information okay. is what makes it valuable. So the best way for me to explain this is if if one of my consigners sent me a picture of a book and it was in a, and the book was uh, all about snakes and it was 1945 that wouldn't excite me but if the book said um, er, er, everything you want to know about snakes in the South Carolina from 1810 to 1888 when you go that specific into a niche, then you know you have a valuable book. Okay. So, you know, you don't want to you don't want to sell books on the history of the Civil War. You want to sell the book about a regiment or about a specific battle. The more specific you get with the book market, the higher the dollar is going to be. That's really good. Yeah. Well, you know, it makes I, it a lot I, easier I sell, to pick and choose. Yeah. I sell a lot of uh, yearbooks and uh, the best yearbooks that I sell are the military yearbooks uh, from, from the battalions uh, from World War II or Korea or Vietnam. You know, those sell for, you know, excess of 100 to $500. Um, yeah. You know, but, you know, because it's, it's something very specific. It's not just about the wo World War II. It's about that, that, you know, that regiment in World War II. Yeah. It's one of the reasons you really like the genealogy books and a lot of the, the like, local um location type books if, if it's referencing a specific city like the history of such and such a place or southern right. illinois or whatnot uh so people groups time frames etc like uh, again kind of our rule with amazon is the weirder the better if, if you wonder why would someone write a book about it then it's probably a good thing to, to check out and research more and the same right. thing holds true there's usually a very very limited audience um, that would actually be interested in looking for those books. And there are also not very many of them printed for the most part. Right. So somebody, as soon as you list it on eBay, instead of like, well, great, I guess I got to pay 200 bucks. They're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is here. I'm so excited to find this and learn more. Yeah. You, you know, I get, you know, I get, I get thank yous 
a lot of times when I when p- people buy books that they've been looking for. Not that there's I have the only copy in the world, um, but you know there are people who are looking for that genealogy book, history of the Smith family in Rhode Island, um, something specific like that. And of course, there was probably well under a thousand print run of that. And so when they can get that and they can tie their own family history finally to this history in a book, uh, they're just so thankful for finding this, you know, and this is why I always call this stuff paper gold. I like that. Yeah. And it's funny too, Caleb, because those genealogy books in a Gaylord, they look like nothing. There's nothing on the cover. It's like library binding. There's just some words on the spine, but there's nothing to show you. It's an exciting book. No, there. That's like the nice little surprise when you pop it open and go, ah, interesting. Mm-hmm. There's some magic here. Before we go to some of these questions, Caleb, do you want to um, talk about his program with us? I can throw the link in the screen. That way people can see it the rest of the show when we're talking. Yeah. So we, we've been, again, you guys are familiar with the restricted inventory. So Romer, Romer the Romer, or Avery, I guess he's in Colombia right now, only speaking Spanish. So maybe we need to do this segment in Spanish. But Romer has that program. So for those of you that can't sell like certain certain gated textbooks or restricted textbooks or just some restricted inventory in general, he's got you know a handful of accounts that are open and available to sell that. So he sells that in consignment. It's traditional consignment. Most of my business now is consignment. We sell for libraries and thrift stores and uh, and entities and and you know big family collections. And we do 50-50 split. We're taking people that don't want to open an Amazon account. They don't want to figure it out. We do the filtering for them. You know, we provide all that value. We sell them and, and typically split profits. Some people do, you know, 60-40 splits, 70-30. It really just depends. 50-50 is kind of what we do. Restricted inventory is basically the same thing for your restricted inventory. You know, the books that you can't sell. So you send them off. Avery team will take them. They've got a whole process for tracking it. And when the book sells, it's something you weren't able to do anyway, and it, it kind of adds some money. There's people doing it in the CD space as well. And Max, uh, I'm sure he's not the only one doing it, but you know, as far as we know, in at least in our community, he's uh, he's kind of taken that on. So I remember he was kicking around the idea. He kind of, I don't think we were the first that you were working with, but I remember going through that process and, and you know making sure you could handle the volume and, and everything that that looks like. But Max's program, and I'll let you kind of to explain that a little bit more, but it's basically the same model, is you're going to share your knowledge, you're going to kind of help be the, the scanning app, so to speak, to actually show which books are worth it. And I'll let you explain how that works in just a second. And then we take the books that Max says are great. Sometimes we FaceTime through libraries, we've gone through older book collections that we find at Gaylords, and then we just package them up. We typically throw them in boxes, build a pallet, ship them down to Max to, to save on freight. And then Max handles the rest. So he knows what the books are worth. Yeah, my team could list them, right? You know, once we know what books are good, we could go through that process. But when people are asking technical questions, my team doesn't want to, you know, step aside and go find that book and answer the questions. We want to, you know, list them like widgets. You know, that's how our business operates on, you know, smaller margins than what Max is doing. And so we're happy to say, hey, he's an expert. He's providing that knowledge. We ship them down to him. And then every month I get a check and a little bit of information it's kind of fun and of course they get the fun text along the way too when we sell expensive books but that's essentially the program is it's hands off for me i box it up ship it out and max handles the rest so it's incredibly easy for me it's kind of a no-brainer sure i'm giving up 50 percent of the profits but i wouldn't have known which books were worth it and it would take a lot more time to research than what max provides so that that's the program in a nutshell and if you guys want, you can reach out. We are a little form. You can fill out just on our site. Uh, we were giving Max some, some. Uh, well, I was giving him. Matthew was being very kind. I was being a little bit impatient. But Max was trying to figure out the link and get into StreamYard. And, uh, you know, technology, he's, he's an expert in the old school things and new school things, not as much. So we made a quick little site for him. We'll actually have a link to this interview. We'll put some more content up over time. So it'll kind of be your digital postcard there. But you can go here. You can find him on Facebook. So uh, thebookflipper.com slash Dusty. Kind of a play with the books in bourbon because old bottles of bourbon are called Dusties. Typically something you find in, you know, grandpa's attic. And uh, old books, you know, tend to get dust as well. So thebookflipper.com slash Dusty. There's just a quick little overview. We're not really affiliated with Max. It's his program. I, I trust him. I endorse him. You know, if he ran for office, I'd probably vote for him. 
Um, but you know, he's, he's very honest. I think you guys can tell that from this interview. So don't do us dirty, Max. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> any of our, our relationships, but Max is a good guy. If you, uh, if you do want to use that link, I think we've worked out a little bit of a commission, so we'll get a little thank you and can help, you know, maybe you could be a sponsor on a future show as, as a result. Um, but if you don't want to give us the commission, if you don't like us, you know, I do want to <laughs> always disclose when it's an affiliate link. You can find Max on your own as well and, and just go around us. We're not we're not trying to be the gatekeepers here. Max has been around for a while. I know Latin Pickers has talked about him. Some other people have as well. So he's, he's developing a name, a good reputation in the community. And that's the program in a nutshell. Nut shell. Can't talk these days. Uh, Max, can you explain a little bit more? Like, how does that process work? And kind of imagine our, our audience is probably bifurcated and some of them are going to be bulk sellers and some are going to be cherry pickers. So how would this program work? for either of those, those crews, um, right. you know, each of the cases. Well, every, every consigner I work with, and I see a few here, uh, chatting it up, um, does it a little bit differently. Um, but more or less what happens is, um, the consigners send me pictures or videos of books. All I need is the spine. I don't even need the cover. You can make a stack of books, 20 high, and just take a picture or shoot me a quick five second video and I will tell you which ones are the good ones. And I'll, I usually tell you within five minutes of you sending me that picture. Um, that way they don't have to wait around on your tables that long. Um, and then you can just put them in a box. When the boxes get filled, you can decide when to send them to me. Um, there are some people like, I think I have a, a call later on with Latin pickers. Actually, we're going live, going through a Gaylord. Um, so uh, we'll probably spend an hour or so looking at books together. And one of the beautiful things that happens on my end is I'm helping you guys understand books better, uh, you know, these non-barcode books. And, and as you do this more and more, you get better and you get quicker at getting that paper gold out of those gay lords. Um, because this whole thing started because of the gay lords and me trying to save these great books that... Uh, the that the FBA sellers weren't even acknowledging. Um, and I'm trying to get them to understand that there's high price books in there. There's money to be made. You're going to be making more money per Gaylord if you use this service that I've set up. Um, but, you know, I do it so many ways. You know, I, I do live videos with people, um, but I, I get pic I get pictures all day long on my phone. And um, I'm saying I'm either going thumbs up or thumbs down or giving it a heart or yeses and nos. And um, it's an amazing experience to, to spend my days every day just going through going through books. Um, I have a pallet of books coming to me tomorrow, uh, about 30 boxes, and it's all the same subject matter. It's all books about mushrooms, fungi, and psychedelia. Uh, and those books, yeah, those books are coming from Texas, and it was all one person's collection. And uh, this is a consignment um, from my friends Heather and Max in Texas. And um, I already know those books are going to fly off the shelves. Um, so, you know, sometimes in these Gaylords, and I've explained this to you before, Caleb, is sometimes you just get that magical Gaylord that came from one person, and you get that one person's collection most of the time they're non-barcoded books that they've been collecting for years. And, um, you know, we can make, we can make money selling those, you know, with, with the platform that I'm trying to set up. Yep. So if someone's doing cherry picking, uh, and again, your response time is pretty quick. I, I hate to, you know, put you on the spot, but I know that you're incredibly responsive to it. If someone's cherry picking and sees a really, you know, fascinating book and it might be five bucks and they're not sure if they should buy it, are you usually pretty quick to respond if they, you know, once they're in the program and they've got that relationship in your phone number, can they just text a photo and you're like, yep, it, it's really good or nope, don't bother. Mm -hmm. They they can, yeah, once I develop a relationship with them, um, they can, they can text me anytime uh, and I get those texts every day. Um, every, you know, I, uh, I got that text the other day and, um, it was a thousand dollar book that that they picked up at a thrift store, um, and they didn't, they're not even waiting for the putting in a box. They've already <laughs> mailed it off to me, so I, I can sell it for them. Um, you know, they could easily sell it themselves, but it's just time. And then it's having to answer questions that you get from prospective buyers on eBay. And if you don't have the knowledge, 
you know, it's it's hard to close that deal on a thousand dollar book unless you know about that thousand dollar book. And and the one thing that I can definitely say um, with 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 confidence is in these Gaylords that are the hundred dollar books and the five hundred dollar sets and the thousand dollar books. They're they're not in every Gaylord, but they're consistently in the Gaylords, and I can tell that by the growth of my business and how and how big it's growing. Love it. So again, it's just a, it's a very easy process. I, I do it occasionally. We do it with some bigger deals. I've actually got, I think I'm really close to closing that, that deal I talked about earlier uh, from a couple months ago, people get very, you know, attached to books, but I've got a pretty big library collection. I'm going to be picking up uh, an individual, you know, the, the, the father passed away and they've got, you know, the family trying to get those books back into the hands of somebody good. And there are some really good historical type books uh, German sets, all kinds of stuff. So I think we're going to, we're going to have a lot of fun with that process. And, uh, we were trying to figure out how to get you up to the, the location, or maybe I was going to go out. I've got a pretty intriguing idea involving a moving company and we'll see if it pans out. So <laughs> if that works, I'll tell a good story next week awesome. on, on the show and hopefully we'll get some good books. Are, are, those, are those the philo philosophical books you sent me pictures on? Exactly. Yep. Okay, that, yeah, I meant to ask you about that. Okay. Yeah, that was some really good stuff eventually coming in. It's been it's been a bit yeah. uh, for those of you that are that are in sales or, or ever trying to land a deal. Never give up. Make sure you're you know don't be annoying. But this was a deal that I hope you know we're really close to landing, and it's something that I've been working on since February. So you know don't be afraid. Every month, set yourself a reminder. Drop a line. Be kind. Offer different approaches, and eventually we were able to figure out something that I think works. So we'll see. We'll see how that pans out. So again, if you guys want to sign up, um, do you have a fancy name for your program, Max? You know, Avery's got restricted inventory.com. Do you have like a, a brand or some sort of a, a yeah, I just I just call it what my eBay store is, common ground finds. Perfect. Um, but I always refer to these books as paper gold. Or paper gold. Maybe I, like maybe I should like do something that. more along that line. A little bit shady, you know, Rapunzel turning uh turning books into gold, but that that could work. We could be spinning the straw. Um, if so people do want to find you again, they can fill out the form on our site. If you want to give us a little kickback, that's great. Otherwise, you can find Max on Instagram at Common Ground Finds. And uh, are, you're not on much other social media, are you? No, I, I don't have time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he's 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 like Emperor Nero over there, giving thumbs up and thumbs down for all the books that come across his path. And uh, he's very pleasant to work with, as you can see, just based on the on the conversation here. He's got a big heart cares about what he does, cares about the people he works with. And uh, I'm, I'm glad we met and I'm glad you're, you're on here sharing your love of books and hopefully giving people a different avenue. Um, so again, if you are ever coming across old books, if you're doing bulk, especially, you can set those aside. You can send photos in. You can do, you know, set up a FaceTime with, uh, with Max as well. So he's very accessible, very approachable, and hopefully gives people different options on ways to, to, to make some money. You know, if you can start squeezing an extra $30 out of every Gaylord you go through, you know, for those of you doing truckloads, what does that turn into over the course of, you know, a couple months, a couple years in, uh, as well? So uh, it's a great program. Feel free to reach out to Max as well. I realize that us saying the bookflipper.com slash Dusty makes people think your name is Dusty. And if <laughs> people do that, we'll take the, take the blame. Yeah. Uh, we got two other orders of business and then we'll kind of wind this down. We've been going an hour. So thanks for your time, Max. Thanks for those of you that jumped in live and asked some questions. We have a giveaway to do at some point here, which we can do right at the end. And we also have some questions that have been coming in. And so yeah. we'll work our way through those and we'll just rapid fire those your way, Max. Okay, perfect. Um, so let's go through some of these right here. We can kind of rapid fire read off some of these. So someone's been buying in bulk for about two years. They've saved all their antique books for slow months. You guys are going to make some serious money together is what they said. So oh, that's a good sign right there. I look cool. forward to hearing from them. Uh, someone asked, do you sell groups of books? There's been a few questions like this. Do you ever package groups of a similar topic together and sell them as a package set? All the time, um, whether whether it's vintage science fiction paperbacks or the Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, um, the Care Bears, um, anything like that. Um, yeah, I, I'm always packaging things together and putting them in lots um, because you have to be a little bit different than everybody else out there. And uh, sometimes you can give a better value for six vintage science fiction magazines rather than making six different listings. You can get rid of those six books quicker 
free up that shelf space for the next group of books. Yeah. That's good. This is one of the most common questions that I forgot to ask, but I've seen it here a few times already. Signed books, nonfiction, fiction. What does it mean and how do you know if it's worth more? Depends on the signature. Um, most signed books have higher value than a regular book um, if it wasn't signed. Um, I know that uh, Jurassic Park is coming out again in Christmas time, I think. Um, so any Michael Crichton book that has a signature is going to sell for more than the Michael Crichton book without the signature. Um, so these are things that I often think about. You know, I, I'm always going to um, the web pages, what movies are coming out in a year or two. So I can start buying those books up um, before it hits the hits the market. Um, but signed books are great. I mean, I have a I have a book in my collection right now that's for sale. I think I have it listed at eighteen thousand five hundred dollars. It's uh, it's a limited edition book. Only uh, three hundred copies were produced, and it was written and signed by John F. Kennedy when he was a senator from Massachusetts. And the book is about 30 pages and it's all about his father, Joe. Um, but it only went to close family members at the time. And any one of those copies right now is all is already in someone's, you know, collection. Uh, there was only 300 produced and, uh, I have one of those copies right now. Um, but did that are, copy come out of a Gaylord or how, where did no, you? No, no. I, I actually recently bought a, I bought the book collection, from a book dealer who had passed away. I bought it from the, the estate of the family. Um, she was a book collector for 40 years. And so um, I had the privilege and the honor to buy her entire 6,000 book collection. Oh, wow. um, and uh, because she was a book dealer, you know, you know, every one of those books was a highly desirable book. Yeah. Um, she did quit the business before the boom of the internet. Um, um, but one of the beauties of her books is because this is the way book dealers did it back in the day. They would take a light leaded pencil and they would write notes on the inside cover page of what the edition was. And so every one of the books I have of hers has all this great information in it. It makes my job easier. It even has her price. But that price could have been from 1978, so I have to update the prices. But um, I was very privileged to get her collection. Yeah. So a lot of collectibles like Rolexes and you know bourbon, as we've talked about it here, over COVID have really gone through the roof in terms of value. Have you seen a similar uptick over the last two years with collectible books? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, they're not buying the book to get it graded and then putting it into a plastic hard case like they do are with video games or VHS tapes even right now. Um, but you know, there are people who will tell you that the internet is not the best thing for the book dealer because now all the competition is right there. Um, years ago before the internet, you know, in order for my boss back in the day to sell a book, someone had to walk into the store to buy that book. Um, I, I find it a great blessing to be able to, for someone to pull a book out of a Gaylord, send it to me, me to list it and me to sell it to someone, you know, in Maine, um, you know, 3000 miles away from me. Um, so I, I just find the, the advent of uh, the internet and selling books to be a, a, a magical, a magical place. So it's a beautiful blend uh, coming together of old old yeah. school and also new school but, technology. Yeah, but not every not every book dealer believes that. Sure. Well, and, and again, we we bought out bookstores that have gone out of business, and the owners are very angry at at the internet because it ruined their business. Right. But yep. Again, just like you know, we talk about with selling on Amazon. If you don't adapt, then yeah, you're going to get left behind. Right. And business is changing, economies are changing. Uh, you know, COVID accelerated so many things. Mm -hmm. and if you don't, you know, keep up with things, you'll you'll get swept swept behind and left behind. So right. But but to answer your question, the answer is yes. That there is definitely an uptick in 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 these books. So let, uh, zoom out over the last twenty years, let's call it. Have has there been more of an interest in collectible books or less of an interest? And have prices kind of gone up on some you know classic historical books, or are they holding steady? Like what what are what are pricing? trends over the last well, couple yeah it all depends on the book of course but i i do believe that there's definitely an uptick of prices um but it, it all depends on what's going on in the world today um you know 
politically we have blue states and red states, but how that translates for me is I sell a lot more Civil War books. Uh, you know, you can, you can make the reference on how that happened, you know, why I think that happens. But, you know, we, we sort of have a divided country right now. And, and I think people are trying to reread history and find out, you know, what a divided country looked like in 1865. Yep. Cool. Well, we got a couple more questions there, Matthew, that have come in. I, I want to just, since, I, since I'm asking the questions, what's the coolest thing you've sold in the last, you know, six to 12 months? And then what's the most expensive thing you've sold in the okay. last? Okay. Wow. I knew, I knew that question was coming. Um, the most expensive, I can only talk about vaguely. I think I've shared with you before, Caleb. I can't talk real specifically, yep. but it was a, it was a forty five thousand dollar collection. Um, it was a collection that was left behind, and um, I had acquired it, and um, a certain group had bought the entire collection to preserve it um, for the future, um, and so they bought that collection for forty five thousand dollars from me. Um, but one of the most expensive books I sold is, um, the first, um, Alcoholics Anonymous book, which, um, for all my Gaylord digger throughers is a red book. It's not the blue one that you're finding the second, third or fourth edition of. If you find that one that's red or has that yellow, white and uh, red cover, you know, you're going to make a minimum of $5,000. I think I sold mine for $8,000. Um, and um, that did not have a dust jacket on it, but that first edition is probably one of the highest sought after books out there. Yeah, well, that's a good tip because I'm sure I'm sure people have seen that one out and about. It is rare, uh, obviously, yeah, which is why it commands the price, but it's definitely out there. Right. This is a similar question for you. What's the most amazing thing you've ever found inside a book? No, ah, hundred dollar bills. <laughs> That's easy. No, plural, multiple hundred dollar bills. Oh yes, yes, hundred dollar bills. Yes, often found either in Bibles or cookbooks. That's why you don't throw those cookbooks away in the Gaylord. <laughs> what are the questions you see in there, Caleb? Or if you can see those comments that I see that you guys want to tackle, there's quite a few different ones in there. Uh, someone asked, well, you might have addressed this already. Someone said they get a lot of vintage paperback romance novels. Does that stuff tend to, to sell well, or is there any specifics to look out for in, in that world? Yeah, well, it's funny. They sell every day, um, and um, I'm not opposed to it. Um, if if one of my consigners said, Max, we have a Gaylord, and there's, there's 800 romance novels, and it's six different authors, I would definitely, I would definitely go for that um, because you can sell those in lots, um, you know, put them together, and 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 they're and they're going to sell every day. Um, and in the end, I want my consigners to be happy with their monthly money, and I want to be able to move the product to the people who want it. So everybody, everybody's happy with that. But um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't save them one at a time and try to build something. I would only want my consigner to. Um, just happen upon a Gaylord of them. Yep. That's good. Uh, what about, are there any books or places that people want to learn more about selling these types of books that they can go to aside from this podcast right here? Well, I, I would say that the best advice I would give someone if they have the time is to work for a rare book dealer even volunteer their time five or 10 hours a week because you have to be hands-on with these books. Very hard to learn about old books through technology. Uh, you have to hold them. You have to see what it's all about. You have to know, you have to know who the great illustrators of the day were um, and, and look at those illustrations. You have to know about the copyright year and the different publishing companies and what their print runs were. And this is not information that's just readily available without doing a dissertation, you know, for the next two years. Um, but, you know, that's how I learned back in the, you know, back in the day in my twenties, um, working in an antiquarian bookstore and actually holding these books. They're still around. Um, there's probably one in every major city, if not two or three. And if you wanted to really learn about it, I would go into one and uh, ask them if they needed some help. Yeah. Imagine that you put the time in, you know, surround yourself with it, surround yourself with those that love it, and you'll, you'll probably pick up a few things. Oh, but yeah. the answer is there's really no easy way to do it, which is one of the values you provide. You've, you've put the homework in. 
Um, obviously, you're a teacher as well, or, or you know, in a past life, you were a teacher. And so that you're able to kind of share that uh, knowledge with everybody else as well. But the more that you'll interact with Max, the more you start to develop an eye. You know, at first, again, I was asking, where do I go? What sections do I look at? Where should I spend my time? And pretty soon you kind of learn what kind of has that value and it, it actually speeds up the learning curve um, with future interactions as well. So those are all good. I think the bottom line is Max probably needs to start a podcast or uh, maybe a radio show just like Steve did. Do something here and start. start <laughs> this I, know you, I know you've got a, an email thing going out. Maybe you can start expanding the reach of that a little bit as well. You know, what we should have done is we should have had people instead of just post questions, post some books they currently have. Sure. And we could show them his information or his skills live sure. on the live stream. Well, no, I, I didn't think yeah. about that before. It's a missed opportunity. We've got to have you back on. I am open to a monthly I, a monthly uh, podcast with you guys, but unless I have Matthew on my side, I, I would never be able to run run my own. I, I'm, I'm amazed I, I'm even on this right now and logged in. <laughs> Uh, have you um have you hired anybody else to help with with listing packing or are you just a one man band at this point? No, I have three employees. They work between twenty and thirty hours a week. Um, I do all the pricing, all the research. They do all the listing, all the shelving, and the shipping. Perfect. So all my time is on the book and the price of the book. Perfect. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great example of doing what you do best and right. kind of outsourcing your hiring yeah. for uh, filling yeah. the gap. I work, I work out of my house. I had the luxury of working out of my house, um, but but I have employees who either take books home or they come to the house and they work. I remember seeing a question earlier about uh, background or whatnot and um, what backgrounds I use. I just use poster board you buy at the dollar store. Uh, it doesn't have to be fancy. Um, you know, I, I sometimes I'll just change up the colors just to make the books look different um, so it all doesn't run together when someone's scanning my site. Yep. But it's just you know dollar store poster board. Love it. Cool. Well, um, I think we've been going a little over, yeah, about an hour fifteen. So I think we're going to wind it down here. Thanks for your time, Max. Matthew, I think we're going to do a giveaway. It looks like we only had one comment on the Facebook post with questions. So I don't. Think Did you say was it Facebook post that it was, or just in here in general? I forget what it, we said. Up to here, because I think. Doug already won something before. So Doug's kind of sneaking in, sneaking it there. Um, so maybe do a kind of a random with people here. We kind of threw out Max, if you're open to it, we'll throw you on the spot again. If you're open to doing uh, you know, 20 minute call with whoever wins this and just kind of, you know, let them ask you questions and, and pick their brain. And then we can send some, uh, some scout IQ swag their way as well. Completely so open for that. Yes. Let's get I your can find a winner right now if you give me a second. But what is your Instagram? Someone wants to know what your Instagram was again, or are you on Instagram? I am on Instagram. It's common ground finds with an S at the end and then the little line underneath after the S. I don't know what you underscore. Underscore. So it's all lowercase, no spaces. No common, space. common ground finds. finds. Yep. All one word. And then an underscore, because probably someone already had common ground finds without the underscore. <laughs> Amazing how that works. Well, as Matthew does that, we'll figure out who wins the uh, the swag kit and then some time with you. Again, thanks for being on here. Thanks for sharing your heart, your uh, your excitement for Dusty Books. And if you guys do want to sign up and check out Max's program, whether you're doing cherry picking or bulk, please check out thebookclipper.com slash Dusty. And we do these every Thursday. Next Thursday, I will be uh, filming from a very special location. So tune in to see where that is. That's something I've been excited about for a while here. Um, and we'll have to pick a guest. We've got a couple in mind. So we'll, we'll get somebody good on for next week. It'll be Books and Bourbon episode six. So the fact that we've been going for more than two or three blows me away, and uh, we'll see how long these continue to go. So, Matt, you want to pick somebody here and yep. then sign off? So I've got them pulled up right here, except the problem is it's a YouTube one, so we just have a YouTube username. So what we're, I guess we'll do, so it's, London Aircraft is the YouTube name. This was the question that came through from them. If this is you and you're still watching, reach out to either, let's do this. Let's reach out to either the support email. So support at scoutiq.co or find me or Caleb on Facebook or Instagram. Shoot us a message and let us know this is your username on uh, YouTube. And then we will connect you. If this doesn't work out, we'll find someone else after we've signed off. Uh, if you don't worry, reach out in what, 24 hours? 10 yeah. minutes, five minutes, Clock is ticking. three minutes. 
I'm just 24 kidding. hours. <laughs> 24 <laughs> hours. We'll just select someone else on the list here and we'll reach out uh, personally to that person. But congratulations on winning that. And yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with us. And this has all been super interesting because I know very little about this, but you've already given me just enough information that I feel more confident looking at some old books and trying to pick out some value that I would have the start of this. So thank you for sharing all that. Oh, you're welcome, Matthew. And you can always text me. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> well, just a quick shout out. You said you're doing a kind of a live walkthrough with um, Gaylord's tonight with uh, Latin Pickers. I have one scheduled tonight and I have one scheduled uh, tomorrow. Yes. Perfect. So check that out at Latin Pickers. Oh, it's, um, no, it's, it's not live like that. It's between Latin Pickers and I. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was going to be something no. to look over your shoulder and see the process, but. Maybe, that's, a great, maybe. that's a great idea, though. <laughs> Follow Latin Pickers on Instagram. They got good content, but uh, really, you're not invited to that love, party. I love those guys. Yeah, <laughs> only. So uh, we'll we'll get you back on the channel soon, just to kind of to learn more about what sells well. Maybe share some examples. Maybe put you on the spot with some real sure. photos. This has been fun. Hopefully, yep. you guys got the value. If you did, comment on uh, on YouTube. Hit smash that like button as as the the influencers say, but uh, it does help. It does help our, our channel get some traction. We do appreciate that. So thanks for coming on. If you guys are uh, drinking anything, we'll, we'll sign off with a, a healthy cheers and we'll catch you next week. Cheers. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you.